All right, welcome back to the Mediaverse Studios podcast. I'm Jake, and today we have with us Carson Morrissey. She's a very talented filmmaker, writer, director, editor, all the things, including like stage actress from Cedar Falls, Waterloo area. And we're just very pleased to have her with us. Welcome, Carson. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here and be talking to you. And yeah, so we are here in our horror podcast set i know i was you know, obsessed with it the second that i saw it i think <laughs> the queen of iowa horror has got to be sitting oh, here right? you know? <laughs> <laughs> also though no you can you can say that that's fine but also like there are a lot of great horror filmmakers <laughs> in iowa but that means a lot to oh, me man. uh um yeah I, I was uh immediately freaked out because you have a the the clive barker collection double feature vhs hellraiser tapes oh, yes. here and clive barker is my writing idol uh, and I love these movies. So, uh, yeah, Absolutely. no, happy to be on, on the, the horror set. That is really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, something that Walker put together. We've got lots of cool memorabilia. We have the Linda Blair signed Exorcist poster and the George Romero signed. Uh... And George Romero is another one that, like, he was indie his entire career. Yeah. Like, he made movies in his hometown with his friends. Like, yep. that's, yeah, he's yep. the dream. And yeah, so these actually belong to one of our guys, Derek Smith. He has the okay. pipe. Those are his Clive Barker VHSs oh, and awesome. then the posters are his and some of the other props and stuff. But well, uh, tell him I fucking love all of his stuff because I'm, I'm obsessed <laughs> with this whole thing. So yeah, this is just like what I think my office is going to look like someday when I have my own house <laughs> that I can just make my own little creative space. I like, yeah. yeah, paint the walls black and put horror posters up everywhere. So yeah. I want to try to like release this podcast like right before Halloween. So oh, just like we're there so and we're cool. talking to you and yeah, that'd be perfect. So uh, try off the bat. I know that you had an event yesterday uh, in Iowa city at film scene and you were screening your new film rot. Yeah. Um, so rot showed, I actually had three movies that showed at the, uh, kind of after hours, uh, section at okay. snake alley festival of film, uh, in July. Uh, and at that event I was approached, uh, by Ross from film scene, um, and offered a chance to show my work at film scene as part of their, uh, late shift of the grindhouse series, I love which that. is awesome. Yeah. Um, so of course I was super excited. And so, yeah, this was the first of those showings, uh, Rot showed last night. It was actually before um, a screening of uh, The Hunger with David Bowie, right? Uh, which was a lot of fun. Yep. Um, Sarandon and yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. it was great. Um, I, I waited to watch it until last night. That's awesome. Just so I could like see it fresh. Um, but yeah, so it was it was crazy. It was almost a full house. Wow. Um, it was the first screening I've done in a while that wasn't for like a film festival, um, yep. and easily like the the most like official screening i've had because like other than at film festivals i've never gotten to see my work like just on a movie screen before wow, yeah. like that um and so it was it was a really really cool experience uh we have other things planned for the future which is also really exciting because film Very scene cool. is such a cool organization i love i love film scene um and so the fact that like i get to show stuff there now yeah. doesn't feel real how was, um, the, how was the reception it was good think? people liked it um i mean well at least nobody came up to me afterward and was like i hated that but like <laughs> sure. the 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 reaction i got was good it seemed like people really enjoyed it yeah. um was there like an audience q and a uh, there was a short one. Yeah, we didn't have a lot of time because it was sure, a late sure. night thing and it was between two yep. screenings. Um, but yeah, there were some, uh, there was just some like brief Q&A. Uh, and then I actually went out after the screening and talked to a few people from the audience uh, after that too, which yeah. was really cool. That's when like the um, real yeah, like, filmmaking yeah. chat happens is when it's just like, you know, out of the um, theater and just kind of... But uh, I, can I swear? I'm okay to of swear. course, yeah. Because like, the, no, the, the funniest thing was like, because I was of course super nervous. And so I was walking out immediately after the screening to go talk to some people I knew and I get stopped by this this guy and like his like you know like punk battle jacket because like it's a late night screening thing right, right? he said to hey great fucking movie man and i was like yes <laughs> like awesome people liked it <laughs> so like it was it was cool um also if that guy's watching thanks you made my night um <laughs> awesome. but yeah so it was it was great and it felt like it was it was the kind of crowd and the kind of event i've really wanted to be able to show my work at for so long i mean right. i you know i love weird movies and the kind of movies that, you know, go to like fantastic fest and go to all these like late night after hours screenings. So yeah. it was just, it was cool to get to screen my work in front of an audience like that and have them really enjoy it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So how, I guess, did you get started in filmmaking? You know, what was kind of the, the journey that led you to this, you know, passion that you have? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been pretty much my entire life. I mean, literally before I was old enough to write, 
um, I would come up with stories and have my family act them out and wear costumes and stuff like that. That's cool. um, before wow. I could even like write stuff. I would draw and scribble. Um, eventually, when I learned to write, I would write on the computer and I would just write like whatever crazy stories. I had a binder of just like little short stories that I had written okay. on word processor. Um, that's just sort of naturally transferred into filmmaking because like I, I played with like writing longer stories and it never really appealed to me. I, I enjoyed reading novels, but that was never something like I, I say this having written a novel. Um, <laughs> but like, like it's, it's secondary um, to, to what I really enjoy doing. I just always really loved movies. Sure. Um, and I think it was, you know, I, I started watching rated R films when I was like seven, oh God, um, same. <laughs> you know, so Hey parents, if you let your kids watch movies, they'll turn out like me. So, you know, or me, or whatever yeah. <laughs> make your decisions from there um, but no I, I started watching you know like horror films and like rated r movies at a really young age nice. and i think it just sort of clicked naturally that like oh this thing i enjoy doing which is making up stories and bringing them to, to life in some form or another that can be making movies so i knew nothing about what actually went into making a movie but it was just that the idea of making a movie really appealed to me um and because of that you know, I started literally just like, uh, well, the, the, the whole thing, I had this webcam called the Digital Blue Movie Maker, which was just, it hooked directly up to the computer. So I'd make movies on that. Okay. But from about fifth or sixth grade, I started taking an actual camcorder outside. And we wow. wouldn't have a script or anything. We would literally just be like, okay, we're going to be army men escaping a base <laughs> or we're going to be breaking into a house and we would just make shit up and that would be the movie. Right. Um, and so that was like every weekend when I was in grade school, wow. um, we would just do that. And somehow that turned into this. So <laughs> it really was, I mean, it was just this sort of natural uh, progression from sort sure. of art as imaginary, just play to, yeah actually planning it out and turning it into something that was a bit more structured. Um, and I, I think that that sort of is a key concept I've hung on to even today. I still make movies for fun. Like, so, yeah. So what did you do to kind of build that structure then? So you kind of went, you know, through your primary or secondary education and then, uh, ended up here somehow. So like what yeah. led to that kind of like education was, was it a film school thing or did you kind of go the more like YouTube university route? I kind of neither i okay. i didn't watch a lot of youtube tutorials i did not go to film school um i took some film classes in college but by that point i had already been kind of starting to do what i what i do now i tried, i didn't drastically change my style after that although it did it did teach me a lot about just like the basics of like camera work and stuff which i then promptly stopped doing and just kept doing my own <laughs> weird shit. Um, but no, like it, I, I, you know, not to be flippant. I, I did learn quite a bit in, in college, even though I didn't technically major in film, I actually didn't haven't technically finished college. All right, um, all right. but, um, I did study a lot academically. I've done some YouTube university stuff, but honestly, a lot of what I do is trial and error. All right. I, I kind of have always, followed the approach of there's something I want to do. And I just kind of figure out how to do that my own way. All right. Um, and I, I think that, you know, obviously there are, there are benefits and drawbacks to that, but I do think it has sort of allowed me to create the sort of unique style of filmmaking that has gotten some of these opportunities for me. And that's something that I would um, definitely say about your films is they have a very unique style. You know, yeah. The way that you shoot is mostly handheld and the way that you light is, is very, I would say non-traditional, you know, it's, it's kind of like light the scene. Yes. But also, I, I don't know what you're doing, but the way you're doing it, it's, it's and very the, stylized. The key is that people used to say that as code for your movies are bad. And no. now they say that as my movies are good. So exactly. somewhere in between, yep. I figured it out. I, no, but like <laughs> it, it, it really was that. Yeah. For a long time, I just made shitty movies. Like I, you know, I would go out and I would just make whatever I wanted to do and they would look crazy and haphazard and handheld and no mm -hmm. lighting and all this. And so I would do it a little bit differently next time. Mm -hmm. Um, and really I just watched a lot of movies and I think okay. that a big key element was that I started to figure out what genre of movies I sort of wanted to emulate, which mm -hmm. my two biggest kind of influences are mumblecore which is like a 
form of low budget drama that mm -hmm. came out of New York in the early 2000s and um, like European extreme horror films <laughs> uh, like Martyrs and stuff like that. And Got I it. somehow wanted to take those two things and put them together, which is what I'm still trying to do, um, which amazing. has a lot of like really high contrast, harsh lighting, yep. really dramatic acting. Yep. Um, and so certainly I, I have learned a lot, but there's also just been, again, kind of just a lot of playing around and figuring out how to make the things that I want to make. I also will add, like, I am in no way, shape, or form trying to say, like, oh, you don't need to go to film school, or, like, don't look things up. Do it yourself. Like, <laughs> this is what worked for me. I, and, right. you know, it's still working. I'm still growing and learning. So, like, mm -hmm. this is how I did it. I'm weird. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, this is absolutely not, you know, you know, me saying throw out formal education. I think film school is great. And there's a lot of people I know that are extremely talented yeah. that went to film school and learned everything that, did, that, that they did there. I personally just kind of prefer learning as I go and developing my own unique, weird style. So I like that a lot because it's much more individualistic too, to just strictly to you because film school or even like YouTube university, you're going to learn the rules. You're going to mm -hmm. learn, you know, how to, compose a shot and how to you know light a scene and how to tell the story in a certain way that you know your instructor whoever it is is telling you to you know and so going through it your very own way doing all this trial and error mm -hmm. gives you a very unique way to tell your stories yeah and you know it's you know it's to the point now where like i do know the 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 quote unquote correct way sure. to do things um and i just i frequently ignore it um <laughs> but you know that also is a benefit of the the genre you know i make kind of these heavy surrealistic horror films yeah. so there are benefits to doing things in a way that might catch people off guard mm -hmm. or that is a little bit unconventional and i also just really enjoy not overproducing things i get a kick mm. out of you know, before I bring in all of the fake lighting and stuff like that, like, what can I do with just the lamp that's already in this room and the light from that window over there? Right. And that's something that is part of the challenge and part of the joy for me mm. is working with as little as possible to create as much as I can. I really like that because I think as creators, we get tied to what do we need to make this more you know, clinically perfect mm. as much as we can. And you kind of lose some of that texture and some of that even creative essence that we need as like a almost as like a barrier or like a a a blockade so to speak almost like a how we have like a 48 horror challenge how there's constraints yeah. and i think that you can definitely breed greater creativity within constraints mm -hmm. yeah and i i that's i think that is sort of where i'm at now is like it's at the point now where it's gone from doing it this way because i didn't know what i was doing to doing it this way because it's a conscious choice and mm -hmm. i do think there is a very at least to me having known the stuff that i have made i can kind of see where that started to happen yeah. um and you know obviously getting a nicer camera helped too when i sure. got my black magic i was able to do a lot more with uh lighting and things like that kind of in camera that mm -hmm. i can do now but I love you know, black magic it, cameras. Oh, same. Oh my God. Um, but you know, it really was just, and still is a lot of trial and error and sure. kind of figuring out my own weird way of doing things that allows me to have sort of a unique voice and to create things yeah. that have a sort of cohesive look and feel to them. Mm -hmm. Like I love having a body of work where it's like, you can watch a movie and be like, yeah, that's a Carson Morrissey movie. And I, I think that that's cool. That's you how know? I feel every time I watch one of your films, like this is dripping yeah. with Carson. Yeah. And you know? like, you know, and like, so if, and if people aren't into it, that's also totally fine. Sure. I am, yeah. I am well aware that the kind of movies that I make aren't going to be for everybody. Um, I, I'm not seeking to make movies that are going to be, you know, Oh, everyone's talking about it. Right. Um, the movies that you make seem to have kind of underlying themes of, you know, trauma and also almost like another worldly presence. Yeah. You know, and I really, I really dig it, but you also play in that genre so well. And so I kind of want to hear what inspired you to like go that route with it. And then what sort of influences have kind of helped form those stories? Yeah. So it something I kind of just realized 
recently actually is like you know even the stuff that i we, we were just talking about it outside earlier um like the the first movie i ever made that sort of got some like public recognition was called horrible things and i made it in high school and you can still find it on youtube if you look hard enough <laughs> um and it was about this girl that is having a house party and a bunch of demons show up and chaos ensues and you know it's it is totally this just fun crazy high school and i'm like i'm not in any way trying to like shit on my old work it's what i could make at the time but like you know compared to the stuff i'm doing now it's completely different (laughs) but even that had an element of we're going to take these normal characters and we're going to introduce some unknowable outer force that influences the actions in the film so there's a core element in that that you could totally just draw a line between that and like the tower and you can almost see how we got to where we are Um, And I think I've just always been fascinated by taking ordinary characters or at least seemingly ordinary people and pairing them with forces that are so far outside of their comprehension or their ability Mm. to deal with it um, that they can't deal with it and then seeing how they respond or how they react to those things. Um, So almost like that cosmic horror. Yeah. Cosmic horror is my, my bread and butter, but specifically I, I really like cosmic horror with sort of an almost, religious context mm-hmm. of like um you know i i freely admit i'm i'm not really a religious person but i'm not necessarily anti religion i just tend to think that like if you read the old testament and you read it from a completely like lo- outside looking in standpoint it's sure. horror right it's these oh, people 100%. in in ancient times dealing with this power that is just so far outside their realm of understanding and they're just doing what it says because if they don't it's going to turn them all to dust like that's like that's <laughs> terrifying right absolutely so yeah when you when you remove the whole sunday school aspect yeah of it, yeah this is a horror and story. this is again 100 percent me not i'm not trying to shit on religion at all well, but course. from a standpoint of fiction <laughs> it's fascinating so like the tower especially i i, I really wanted to make something that felt like what would having a vision of an angel or an entity like that actually be like for the person on the ground? Yeah. And, you know, that's really what I'm working on now with a lot of my projects. The salvages is no exception. Okay. Um, and that's, I really don't plan on diverging from that anytime soon because it's just, it's a subject right now that I'm really having a lot of fun with is yeah, that okay. kind of cosmic horror, but specifically where the cosmic entity really isn't necessarily evil it's just sure. powerful, you know? Sure. And it just is. And we have to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's I absolutely, I can talk about the tower all day. Just the way <laughs> that it's written, the way you wrote that angel, the, and the way that you did the audio for that too, it, it pulls you into this story Thank you. and it puts you into, uh, what was your main actress's name? Uh, Linnea. Linnea. Linnea Sumner. Her... One of my best friends and one of the most fucking incredible actresses, actors I've, I've ever gotten to work with in my entire life. The most, so. um, just facially yeah. acting wonderfully, but also the contortions she was able to do. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and Linnea, I think I've already told you this, but for those who might not know and who have seen The Tower, Linnea played the main character and the angel. Oh, so Linnea was both all right, all right. Uh, in that scene, which wasn't originally the plan, actually, but sure. I kind of like it now that it is I, I kinda, that way yeah. because it just it adds an extra level of like weird surrealism to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it... And again, this sort of goes back to like finding my own way of doing things and that like there's no cgi in that sequence at all we just yeah. had linnea stand on a pedestal mm-hmm. and recorded all the angels movements from different angles a bunch of times and then i just layered the shots on top oh, of each cool. other and you know that's a technique people have been using since you know black and white films in mm-hmm. the 1930s is just layering shots yeah um and but it, it I, gave you this like acid trip of a, yeah. of a visual there and that's that's something i'm really planning on playing with in the future because you know, now that I've done something once and it works, I want to figure out how to do it better. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I like working as practically and as low tech as possible. Um, Mm. but yeah, and like, you know, for the, for the dialogue, for the angel, again, I wanted it to have this kind of ancient feel to, I, I literally, like I had to go through and make sure all of the, the syntax was right because I wrote it to sound kind of old English, I guess would be the term. Um, so it's, you know, it, a lot of effort went into making that character as believable as possible. And it was. You, yeah. you succeeded. Let me <laughs> tell you. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about the salvages. Yeah. I don't know much about it other than 
you're shooting it in November, mm-hmm. December? Yep, the first the first two weekends of November. Um, it is a project that has been in development now just over a year now, actually. By the time we shoot, it will have been over a year. Um, and it is about a character named Judith, who is uh, an inmate at the New Canaan Academy for Delinquents, which is like this like religious alternative uh, prison. So like sort of based on the idea of like conversion therapy camps mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But like specifically, this is like a place for parents to send their wayward youths. Okay. Um, except the world has ended or is ending. So 90% of the population is dead. Uh, and basically, okay. it's just this little scattering of leftover wards at this place that is run by this really tyrannical preacher named Reverend Holting. Um, and he's this awful, abusive person. Um, and Judith is um, sort of lost. She is abused by Holting. And the world's about to end, and she's trying to figure out what she's going to do with her life. Uh, she has fallen in love with this girl named Abra, who is also at the uh, New Canaan Academy for Delinquents. Okay. They form a relationship, uh, and then divine intervention happens, and they decide to enact vengeance on uh, the Reverend. Okay. So, yes. Wow. Is this a feature? Kind of remains to be seen. Okay. Uh, the script right. is about 45 pages long. Gotcha. Um, but one thing about my films I have found is they tend to break that rule of like one page equals one minute because oh. I like to leave a lot of space in my movies. I okay. like a lot of quiet moments. Um, and I also tend to come up with things a lot as we shoot and allow okay. my actors to do the same. So like rot is a good example. I think that script was 22 pages long and the script uh, the, the film is like 32 minutes long. Oh wow. Um, and we actually cut things from that script. Whoa. Um, but you know, I'm, I, I like, I consider filmmaking any artistic creation to be a very fluid process. Yeah. Um, I am guesstimating the salvages will be between 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Um, when it's all said and done. Yeah. Probably it, closer to 45 minutes, but we'll see. You just let it be as long as it needs to be. Yes. You know? Yeah. It's not as Which, you're shooting for a feature or for a long short. It's just whatever the story needs to yeah, be. Yeah. And I, I will say 45 minutes is sort of an infuriating runtime because it is going to make it hard sure. to get it into festivals. But yeah. for this project especially, because this is a really personal, like this is one that I've put a lot of work into the story. I'm not really worrying about that for this one. Right. You know, after the salvages, I'll make something a bit more accessible and festival friendly, but like, this is kind of just one for me. I love um, that. And so I'm, I'm yeah. having a lot of fun with it. I'm not really stressing too much about that sort of thing with this. Um, I try not to in general, but I do occasionally try to make things that can get into festivals and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. I do think it's going to be a really cool film. The, the talent that I have in it, uh, my friend Jenna, my, my best friend Jenna, actually, uh, who played uh, the other character in the tower. Oh, um, yeah, okay, the, uh, the tarot friend. Yeah, so they're playing Judith, the main character. Okay. Uh, and then a good friend of mine named Jess, who I haven't gotten to work with in years, is playing Abra, uh, and she's incredible. And then Joe Frenna, who is one of my favorite actors to work with. Uh, he's mostly a stage actor, but he's incredible. Okay. He's playing the Reverend. Wow. Uh, so he's, he's awesome. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's three really, really strong actors that I'm just so excited to get them in this world. Yeah. Um, and then I have Stephanie Schneider doing intimacy coordination for the film. She's gotcha. amazing. Yep. Uh, my good friend, uh, Benjamin is going to be doing lights and sound for us. Uh, Benjamin B not Ben Schmidt. Um, Got it. Okay. but, uh, cool. so yeah, it's, it's a small crew like usual, but mm-hmm. small, but mighty. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, and so it's set in apocalyptic times. Is this like biblical? Apocalypse? It is actually set in the same apocalypse as the tower. Oh. It is literally like I wouldn't call it a sequel to the tower because it's it's more of just another story that takes place during the same event as the tower. Right. Okay. So yeah. Wow. So it's this where there's massive ball of light coming at the earth or yeah, well, it, yeah, it's this it's is. it's the uh, the the sky quakes, the sounds from the sky, and mm-hmm. something is coming toward the earth. Almost and... like the seven trumpets kind of yeah, coming down. Yeah, yep, exactly, wow. exactly. Uh, so yeah, you'll you'll get to learn a bit more about what's causing all of that in this one. Although again, Ooh. how much you choose to trust of what the entities <laughs> say is entirely up to you. Sure. So is this a kind of ongoing universe you're building? Yeah, and in fact. It's a story I've been working on for years. Um, 
So it all started because I learned about these things called skyquakes, which are a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's this phenomenon. They also call them sky trumpets, although I think that name is super lame. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's this actual phenomenon where people have heard these like really loud, like metal on metal or trumpety sounds from the sky. There's all kinds of videos of them on like YouTube and stuff like that. And they're, they're well documented. And nobody knows what causes them. A lot of people think it's like tectonic plate shifting or stuff like that. But to me, I loved the the parallel between that and like the like revelations trumpets in the sky. Sure. So I looked it up because I was just curious if anyone had ever really done anything with this idea before. And there's not a lot of fiction out there revolving around this. So my my pitch is it's sort of color out of space, but with sound. So instead I love of color out of space. Yeah. So instead of like a color coming down from the sky and causing chaos, it's the sound. Okay. And then the entities that are causing the sound. Got it. Uh, so yeah. Wow. So we kind of talked about like what you normally do. You you know, you write, you direct, you edit, you mm-hmm. do filming, you do stage acting. What's kind of your preferred role on set? If I if I had to pick one, like if it was like, okay, you only get to do one thing on this movie and yeah. somebody else is doing everything else, I think I would pick directing. Because there is something about like my, my favorite thing is working with the actors and okay. bringing a performance out and sort of crafting a character. Um, mm. That's what I really enjoy. So mm-hmm. I think directing overall is is my favorite um just because like i in fact very soon i'll be working with a script that i did not write uh, for a different project that i can talk about in a minute um but uh yeah i think directing is my favorite overall writing very very close second but again it's weird because the the way that i i do it it's all so blended for me of like the way that i shoot you know I, i shoot by myself handheld so like the camera sort of just becomes an extension of the whole process. And sure. it's a very fluid process. But I, I think I consider myself a director probably more than anything. Okay. Just because at the end of the day, like bringing out the performances is what makes the movie come to life. So. Absolutely. What is this other project you're working on? I'm about to do a stage production. Uh, okay. I'm actually, by the time this podcast comes out, because I'm announcing it next week, so it should be gotcha. out. Um, I am putting on a production of A Clockwork Orange, the stage oh, play in Cedar Falls. No yeah. Uh, so it'll be wow. next year. It'll be October 11th through 13th of 2024. Wow. Uh, but I officially, like, I have the rights and everything. We're, I'm announcing it in a week. That's uh, amazing. So, yeah, I'm really excited. Oh, I wanted cool. to do a stage production for a long time. Yeah. Um, I actually wrote a play, but I didn't want to start with something that I wrote just because I've never directed a stage pro- right. play before. Now, is this um, a, a pre-written adaptation? It's, it's written by the author of the book. Oh, yeah. So it's right on. It's it's like the movie and the book and the play are all very, very similar. OK. Uh, but that being said, there are differences, too. Uh, but it's it's fun. It's crazy. It's, I mean, it's a clockwork orange. Of course. Uh, so it's going to be wild. I'm really excited about it. Man. I love that. And so yeah. you're going to be directing this. Or yes. It's gonna... yep. cool. uh, yeah. So I'm going to be directing it. I have a couple uh, friends already kind of on the crew for it. Gotcha. Um, auditions will be like next July or August gotcha. and it'll be in Cedar Falls. Keep your eyes open for that folks. That's oh, going to yeah, be, be awesome. That's gonna it's going to be, gonna be so cool. I cannot wait to see that. <laughs> wow. Um, what kind of, I mean, just kind of on the topic of like, creation versus consumption what's mm-hmm. kind of your ratio of what you make versus what you watch and then what do you watch what kind of movies attract you and help you tell your stories yeah um in general i mean i'm, I'm drawn to the weird and controversial mm-hmm. a lot of time like i just watched this movie a couple of days ago called Me- uh, megalomaniac that just came out on amazon prime that was just okay. came out of the festival circuit it's this like crazy European extreme horror film. I actually was kind of male. It was good. I need to watch it again, but it didn't right. quite do it for me. My favorite director right now is probably Julia DeCarno, who made um, mm. Raw and Titan. Um, I really enjoyed Titan. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So that like, was a wild movie. Yeah. But like that is a movie that I watch and it's like, holy shit, I want to make something like this. Yeah. Like that's what I'm aspiring to. Yeah. Um, so. I, I, like, I was watching Titan. I'm like, this could be a Carson film. <laughs> that I was like, that's it's that weird, like super weird, otherworldly yeah. presence vibe. Yeah, it's there, and it's yeah, and you don't really get a satisfying ending. It's just kind of like it just is, and people have to deal with it. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Yeah, because that's how life is. Um, but yeah, no, she's she's probably my biggest idol right now. Her and probably Jennifer Kent is another one I really look up to. The Babadook uh, and the Nightingale. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, but. Uh, I'm drawn to movies like that. It's, if I'm watching it specifically because like I'm trying to watch something 
to learn. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of movies I'm, I'm drawn to. Gotcha. Um, but really, I like anything horror. I just saw Saw X the other day and All right. fucking loved that. That was awesome. So, like, you know, that's the other side of the spectrum, right? Is I still just love a good scary movie. Well, yeah, you got um, fun, too. Yeah, yeah, and... Um, but then, like, I'm also very drawn to dramas and kind of, like, lower-budget indie films like that. Like, again, mm -hmm. anything... Like, earlier Greta Gerwig, that sort of stuff, I'm really, yeah. really into. Okay. Um, my favorite film of all time, probably, is... And I, I, I can never pronounce the name of the fucking movie, even though I love it so much. It's I think it's Sin and Doce, New York, by Charlie Kaufman. Okay. Uh, with... Um, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's a weird movie, but it's so good. Okay. It makes me cry every time I watch I'll check it. Check that out. Um, what time period was that? Uh, it's set in the modern day. Okay. Uh, but it's it's about a guy that gets the genius grant, and he decides that he's going to create a miniature version of his town in New York in this giant warehouse. Okay. So he's creating a real time, real life play of the town oh. that he lives in, and then it gets you know, more and more like microcosmy from there. Okay. Um, but one of my favorite quotes about directing comes out of that movie, which is, I want nothing less than the brutal truth. And that is sort of the, like, like the mantra that I keep with my own films. Wow. So It's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like Charlie Kaufman's just, yeah. Oh my God, nobody writes like him. He's so good. So. <laughs> <laughs> Take kind of to a local more local space is like why iowa why do you stay in iowa what's keeping you here creatively creatively good question um i don't think the kinds of movies that i enjoy making would be particularly successful in like the mainstream film world like i don't think i'm gonna move out to california sure. and make the tower you know like that's just not and then also that's really not what i'm in it for mm -hmm. to be honest like I, I stay in Iowa, one, because all of my family and friends are here, um, and it's it's much cheaper here than it is living out somewhere else. Sure. I think if I was going to move to any big city, it would be New York, uh, because I have a lot of friends out there, and I love New York City, okay. um, or even somewhere like Chicago. But really, I have just found that I'm able to make the kind of things that I want to make, at least for now, here. And yeah. if I ever did want to make something somewhere else, it would probably just be easier for me to go out there on a temporary basis, shoot what I want to shoot yeah. and then come back here. Yeah. Um, what but, are, I guess some of your, some of your, sorry, what are some of your like aspirations as a filmmaker or as a creative of any kind? Yeah. I mean, my, you know, I, I certainly do daydream of, of getting a bigger audience. You know, I would love mm -hmm. to get into like, like uh, I was just saying the other day, I think if I have a dream festival right now, it's fantastic fest. Cause okay. that's the one, like a lot of yeah. like the shutter movies end up yeah. at. Um, so like, you know, I'm not imagining myself winning any Oscars or even going to like cons or someplace like that. Obviously, that'd be fucking incredible. But like, <laughs> you know, I I want to get as big as I can get while staying as weird as I am. Like, you know, oh, I, 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 I truly have no real desire to change my style that radically in order to be more conventionally successful. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm finding that slowly but surely I am managing to grow my audience um and you know it's only going to get better the one thing i do want to do is start getting more production value i, I am going to start looking for like producers and things like that sure. for my movies um but even then not so much so that i can change my production style more just so i can pay people and get better props and better you know kind of resources right um i would say if i have a goal it is just to get the widest audience possible so that people like me have more movies to watch. Um, I like that. Yeah. I mean, like, again, getting distribution on something like Shudder would be a huge, huge dream for me. Yeah. Um, but that's where I'm at. Again, it's sort of nebulous because I'm, I'm trying, I really try not to obsess over that too much. Right. Not to say I don't, please believe me, I'm human. I spend so much time thinking, oh God, I'm behind and I should be doing this. And oh God, I need to be like, I, I really try not to do that because right. that's, I just feel like I can't do, you can't go out of your way to do things the way you want to do them and then expect immediate results. Right. You know, so I, I have to pick and I'm trying to continue to choose being authentic to myself and my own style um, and seeing where that gets me. We, we had this kind of like offline conversation when you got here about, um, 
sort of the creative process versus monetization. You yeah. Know, and making content and making things I, that are accessible to large audiences. There is truly thoughts. no word that turns my stomach more than content. I uh -huh. do not like that word at all <laughs> for any creative process. I mean, even people that do make like, you know, like even if you are on YouTube making watch alongs or play alongs, like you're still making something. You're still putting yourself out there. That's not content. That's still you, right. you know? So like, I don't know. I, I don't like that word, um, which is stupid and semantic, but also like semantics are important. We're writers. Absolutely. Like, so like words matter. Yep. Um, but like, I, I am always going to fall on the side of, I would rather be poor and unsuccessful and making the things I want to make than rich and famous and making what's going to make me richer and more famous. Right. That is absolutely, again, not to shit on anybody that does want right. big conventional success. I think that's great. I think there are a lot of people working in Iowa right now that could be extremely, might be extremely successful filmmakers in the next 10 years. Personally, that's not my goal. Or rather, sure. if it is, I want to get there my own way. Sure. And people have done, we were just talking about like Mike Flanagan, for instance. Absolutely. Mike Flanagan still writes, directs, and edits everything he does himself. Yeah. I don't. I don't remember if he does his own cinematography. I'm not sure, but he de there's definitely a style. So whoever yeah, like he, is, but he again, picks he them. has a consistent body of work. You watch yep. his films, it's like, yeah, I can absolutely tell that he made that. And a consistent so, crew and yeah. cast that he works with as yeah. well. Yeah, so I, I think that if I were to ever break out into the, the bigger world of filmmaking, I'd want it to be like that, yeah. you know, where it's still... You can still see my fingerprints on it. It still has the same feeling as something like The Tower... You know, I want to keep doing the same thing, just bigger. That's mm -hmm. the goal. Mm -hmm. So, how do you balance between? And I don't know what the what your like professional situation is, but how do you balance between like, you know, paying the bills and feeding yourself versus you know keeping true to that you know that ethics behind but behind the art? It's hard. I mean, you know, it's people have day jobs, and especially when you're making micro budget projects, you know, I, I can never expect somebody to prioritize something that we're doing over something that puts food on the table, right. um, which is totally fine. That's, that's part of it. Um, I devote a sizable amount of my free time to this and I'm happy to do it because I'm, I'm a filmmaker. This right. is my favorite thing to do. Um, but I'm lucky that I have a job that is very understanding of this. Like, you know, okay. like I was able to reschedule my, uh, relay out my schedule this week so I could be here. They're very cool about all that. Um, and you know it, it just takes effort but if you're determined enough you, you figure it out you make it yeah. work and you find time to do your own thing so yeah i like that what would you say is something that the uh kind of iowa or midwest filmmaking artistic community needs you know what what is there a lack of that you're you know identifying that you as personally or in your crew yeah uh, like we need this or you know this is something that's missing that's a tough question. I am just always into variance in mm -hmm. what is being made in the style of things that are being made, you know, and this is not, I, I'm sort of cheating because my answer doesn't necessarily affect anything anybody does, but like, you know, I, I would love for more people to start just making unabashedly weird things. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think that, this isn't so much an Iowa specific problem as much as just, and this actually this isn't really, really a problem. This isn't really Iowa specific as much as just indie specific, but I do think there is so much pressure on artists of any stripe to become professional. You know, if you, oh. if you like there, there is so much pressure to do things right, to make it in the industry, to move up some invisible ladder. Um, and I really don't like that because I think that's not what we should be making art for. We should be making art because we love it. And granted, again, this is my opinion. Sure. And I think that if that is what you want and that's, that's the grind that you want to do, absolutely more power to you. But I do think there is sort of this implicit pressure of like, well, shouldn't you be trying to do this? Shouldn't you be trying to complete X, Y, and Z so you can get to this point, so you can do this, so you can do this, so you can right. do that. And I think that it often pushes people to sacrifice their own weirdness, their own little quirks, because it's going to make them more successful further down the line. And I really wish that wasn't the case. And I'm not even saying that mm -hmm. that's not true, that that might not be the case. Right. But I just wish that we were able to 
be a bit freer to express ourselves without the pressure to meet some kind of unattainable professional bar. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I am very happy to be making the weird stuff that I do. I'm happy to be privileged to be able to make the weird stuff that I do. Um, but I would always just encourage people, you know, take time, no matter how professional you are, no matter how driven you are to accomplish that milestone and just take a weekend and just make some weird off the cuff thing with your friends. Yeah. Like that, that, we can't lose that. Yeah. I think there's, uh, there's so many times I go to festivals and I meet new people, especially like from like out of state or things like that, where it's just like, it just seems like they don't even enjoy it anymore. It's all about yeah. like, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to get distribution on this. So we're going to do this, this, and this, and now I'm going here and then I'm doing this and I'm raising money for the, and it's just like, it's a job. It's a job. And yeah. it's just like, don't let it become a job so much that you forget why you did it in the first place. Don't forget the first time you picked up a camera when you were a little kid and thought, holy shit, I can use this thing to make anything. Yeah. Like that's the magic of it all. Right. Mm, I like that. So like, that's, I, I think if there's anything that we need, again, I'm not really saying this is even an Iowa specific thing, but just in right. general, it's an art. We are artists. Yeah. And I think that when we lose that, when we try to make it a business when we try to present ourselves, like we're, not artists we're something else we lose the whole point of this in the first place which is we're fucking playing pretend with our friends and putting <laughs> it on camera you I know like and like you can be very professional and you can have big dreams i do yep. but i don't want to do that in spite of or, or to spite the the um the, the fun you know yeah what are what are carson's tips on cultivating weirdness <laughs> Carson's tips on cultivating weirdness, dye your hair uh, immediately. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, I, I think that don't be afraid to make it a little bit goofy. Don't be afraid to look stupid. Mm. I, that, okay, don't be afraid to look stupid. All That's right, a, like that actually something I say on set a lot, uh, specifically with horror. If you want to get into like the nitty gritty of like horror filmmaking, one of my favorite examples is Hereditary. Have you seen Hereditary? I love Hereditary. Yeah. So the 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 dinner scene when the, the don't you raise your voice at me you little shit that whole scene, <laughs> yeah. she is acting to the rafters like it's yeah. so wild and over the top and she's doing all these like rubbery facial expressions Tony and Collette. like yeah, yeah yeah and like it would look silly or stupid on any other context but yeah. she sells it and commits so well that it works mm. and I think a lot of times and again I'm not critiquing anyone in particular. But when I watch indie films at festivals, there are so many moments where I'm just like, you were too concerned about how that was going to look. Held back. When, yeah, you, you held back because you didn't want to look dumb. And sometimes if you let go of that and you just have fun and don't be afraid to be weird, don't be afraid to let your face do that weird thing that you know it's going to do, <laughs> you're going to end up with something better because it's real. Yeah. You know, it's genuine yeah. behavior, not just acting. Yeah. Like, you know, people make ugly facial expressions. People say, people stumble over their words and say dumb shit when they're nervous. Yep. You know, and like so much of horror has a lot in common with comedy. Agreed. And so okay, go ahead. My, my tip on weirdness or tips on weirdness would just be anytime you have those little moments where you want to hold back and be like, hmm. I don't want people to take this the wrong way. I don't want this to come off silly. Just go for it and see what happens or at least shoot it both ways. Yeah. You know, I know that on things that I've been a part of directed or, you know, ran camera or whatever, you can tell when an actor is like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to be seen this way. Yeah. You know? But, and, and it's like, okay, you know, respect or whatever. But when you see someone like truly commit to the part yes. and to just, they, they've done this like internal examination and they're like this, I, I am now this character. It's not necessarily a method thing, but it's just like they've, they've went someplace, they found something and they accessed it on camera. It's so it's special phenomenal. to see. Yeah. And I, I think that that's, if there's anything I'm particularly proud of with my work, especially recently, it's that I think I, I, I've managed to bring that out in the actors that I work with. Um, that's a very amazing talent to have as a and director. I, and I, I do think that that's, though, a benefit of the the kind of small scale that I work on. Sure. You know, I don't have 10 people on set doing things. It's mostly just me, one other person, and a camera. And mm -hmm. that kind of lets you really take the time to get into the nitty gritty of things like that. So right. that that's something I don't want to lose. Um, so don't be afraid to be That weird. was a tip on weirdness, though, and you asked for tips on weirdness. <laughs> Dye your hair. Don't be afraid to embarrass yourself. 
<laughs> bring more weird people on set. Involve your friends. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Find, <laughs> if, if I think of more, I'll let you know. Find your passionately weird tribe. Yeah, yeah. Like... Just I, I guess I, that really encompasses a lot of things. Just yeah. don't don't hold back. Don't ever hold back. What is something that you would want to say uh, through story to an audience? You know, what is a message you would want to convey? Or Ooh. what are you trying to convey through your current <clears throat> stories? Ooh, very good question. My My films tend to be rather nihilistic and depressing Mm -hmm. uh, and have very unhappy endings. Um, But what I'm often trying to get at is sort of an essential humanity, right? That like, if you take a normal, regular, everyday person and introduce them to crazy circumstances, um, that people will do crazy things. But I also truly do believe, despite my what my films might suggest that people are pretty much fundamentally good um and i Hmm. really do believe that the the direction of life and the universe is generally decent um so i think that what i'd want people to know going into my films because even if it's something like the tower which like there isn't really a lot of messaging in the tower (laughs) it's kind of just a a crazy nightmare thrill ride which is awesome but um with something like the salvages, it has a bit more of a message, which is just that you can find joy, you can find happiness, you can find hope, even in really dire circumstances. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are having to do right now, yeah. I think. Yep. Like, I, I will say that is something that I do sometimes think is like, God, like... You know, sometimes life is so shitty right now, and here I am just making these awful, dark nightmare <laughs> things, and then be like, hey, everyone, watch this. But, like, you know, it's it's not real, so it, mm. it's fine. Well, there's but, even some value in that. Yeah, yeah that's why it's, I like it's horror cathartic, movies. and, you know, yeah. it lets people experience something crazy that isn't actually happening to them. Right. But, you know, I, I do believe that there is sort of a fundamental goodness in people, at least in most people, but I think in, in everybody deep down somewhere. And if you can find those people, if you can find that in yourself, you you can experience terrible things without letting them break you. Um, mm. So. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so much. Wow. <laughs> hmm. That's what I love about horror movies is yeah. that it is, you are, it is a nightmare thrill ride, but it's also, you know, you're entering this dark world outside of your own you know, potential darkness and you can i don't know um find something that's positive through it i don't know yeah well that like that even like for sense. me like okay so like the tower is its own thing but then like the salvages takes place in that same world so i'm already taking the lens out and saying okay well here's another story that's happening it's also dark and depressing but like there's also elements of like hope in this story that weren't there right. in the tower um i say that now and people are going to watch the salvages and be like what the fuck are you talking about but like <laughs> you know it's there um well, it, it's hard because I, I do make a certain kind of horror film, sure. but they don't necessarily reflect my actual personal beliefs about life and the universe and whether people are good or bad, you know? Yeah. So, but I mean, I mean, even the tower has beautiful imagery, hmm. you know, you have that shot of the sun where she's walking to the tower yeah. and that was just like the most, uh, it, and it's weirdly uplifting. Yeah. You know, she's in this fever dream of, whatever this you know angelic state you know chasing the apocalypse up to this tower or whatever and it's beautiful well and that's that's sort of the 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 horror and the mystery of it is that we don't really know why this is happening if these entities are good or bad or to what end any of this is Mm -hmm. and you know again that's that's to me the fascinating thing about these sorts of stories is that the people experiencing them wouldn't know that it doesn't matter yeah. why would this thing care if you understand why it's doing what it's doing right so um yeah that was a very deliberate choice to make it very overtly beautiful and blissful and good yeah. and then still have all this terrible stuff going on <laughs> um but you know it's it's i have a much more optimistic view of people and the world than my movies would suggest <laughs> um and you know it to me the horror films are a good a good way to play around with darkness without i don't know i'm not, I'm not saying anything that a million horror analysts haven't said before <laughs> but like okay 
it's a way to experience something nasty and something scary uh, that is safe. Agreed. That isn't yeah. actually happening to you. Yep. And to have a good time with your friends while doing it. So. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Um, anything else you want to say on the podcast? Anything about yourself or about art or about your crew or any shout outs you want to give? Oh, God. Um, I love what I do. This is what I live for. I will be making movies for as long as I am able to hold a camera and coming up with stories, hopefully, after that, if I lose the ability to do that. <laughs> uh, this is my my life. Um, I am thrilled with the recent attention my work has started getting, like that the film scene thing still yeah. feels fucking crazy. You know, I'm, I'm still a 13-year-old kid running around in her backyard making movies. Yeah. Um, I can be found on Instagram and Facebook. I am Matriarch Films or Matriarch yeah. Films Iowa. Um, you can also track me down personally. I don't care. Send me a friend request. <laughs> um, my name is weirdly spelled, so I'm easy to find. Why hide? <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I just, you know, even if my movies are, are dark and depressing, I hope people enjoy them and yeah. can get some cathartic fun out of them and watch them with their friends and grab each other and go, oh shit, that was so scary, and then have a good time. Um, Shout out, I guess, to all of my dear friends that are also doing this or that support me or that just deal with me constantly talking about this stuff. <laughs> um, it's, it's again, it's, it's what I live to do. Um, and I am so grateful to be doing this and to be seen and to have the opportunity to continue doing it. So make weird movies. Uh, making weird movies. I make love weird it. movies. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we've got, man. But thank you so much for being on here. Thank you for having me. This really, was a blast. Yeah, I had a great time. We're going to have to have you on again. And Please. we'll have to have you out here working on films and stuff. I will definitely be out here working on films. Yeah, I don't have back any time. This is awesome. Thank you. I love it. Well, that was uh, Carson Morsey. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Wait.